Let us prepare for worship. O Word of God, come into this space. O Word of God, send us your grace. Open our minds, show us your truth. Transform our lives anew. Amen. Some who were present on that occasion told Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices. He replied, Do you think the suffering of these Galileans proves that they were more sinful than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. What about those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were more guilty of wrong, wrongdoing than everyone else who lives in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. Jesus told this parable. A man owned a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. He said to his gardener, Look, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree for the past three years, and I've never found any. Cut it down. Why should it continue depleting the soil's nutrients? The gardener responded, Lord, give it one more year, and I will dig around it and give it fertilizer. Maybe it will produce fruit next year. If not, then you can cut it down. At that time, some Pharisees approached Jesus and said, Go, get away from here because Herod wants to kill you. Jesus said to them, Go, tell that fox, Look, I'm throwing out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will complete my work. However, it's necessary for me to travel today, tomorrow, and the next day because it's impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you, how often I have wanted to gather your people just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you didn't want that. Look, your house is abandoned. I tell you, you won't see me until the time comes when you say, Blessings on the one who comes in the Lord's name. Pontius Pilate was the brutal prefect responsible for administering the Roman-occupied lands of ancient Israel and ancient Judea. In today's reading, we get a bloody description of an attack that he ordered on pilgrims as they offered their sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem as they were going about their religious duties. The New Revised Standard Version of the Bible describes Galileans, quote, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, end quote. Pilate was such a despicable character that even Rome noticed. In the year 37, they will recall him for his cruelty in Samaria. Living under this kind of brutality had to have been traumatizing for the people of Jesus' time. Seeking meaning in the face of inexplicable horror, the pe people do what people sometimes do. They rely on their childhood faith. They rely on a worldview in which bad things happen to people because they've done bad things. This theology dates back at least to the book of Deuteronomy in the 7th century before Jesus. But truth be told, we still see vestiges of it even today. By the time of Jesus, this ancient theology, this idea that God rewards and punishes us in our lives, for our actions in the now, was no longer universally accepted. Of course, the nuances and inexplicable nature of natural disasters, 
and the oppressive behaviors of Romans were not the result of God's punishment. Of course not. Still, in crisis, we often revert to easy answers and to childhood theologies because we want something simple that we can hang on to. And so a group of people, undoubtedly traumatized by Pilate's actions, approach Jesus. They tell him about the cruelty inflicted upon people practicing their faith at the temple. They want to know how people practicing their faith could have been victims of such a heinous act. Were they more sinful than others? Tempted to rely on childhood thinking to find meaning, they want Jesus to give them some clarification. And Jesus uses this moment of trauma to answer their question and to teach something else. He replied, Do you think the suffering of these Galileans proves that they were more sinful than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. For sure, this shift feels a bit harsh. Jesus moves from hearing the people describing a trauma-inducing event to quickly answering their question and then telling them, repent or you'll experience the same thing. I suspect that the abruptness of this is more reflective of Luke's writing, more reflective of translations, than Jesus' actions and words themselves. Regardless, Jesus uses this moment to teach about the importance of caring for our faith. If we are to live full lives, we need to nurture and grow our faith. An untended faith is a dead faith. And so Jesus uses the crisis as an opportunity, a teachable moment, if you will, to emphasize that faith must be nurtured. Though Pilate's order to murder Galileans at the temple in Jerusalem was not the result of personal sin or because God was angry at those, those, those Galileans, there is something that we can learn here. Jesus points out the importance of nurturing our faith before and in, the admit, and, and in the midst of challenges, in the midst of horrible traumas. One of those critical parts of faith, one of those really important parts of faith, is repentance. In the words of Jesus, unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. Repentance. Oh, what a churchy word that is. Repentance is to turn back toward God. It is to confess our sins, our mistakes and failures, so that we can refocus ourselves on becoming the people God dreams we can become. Without repentance, without understanding and acknowledging, we cannot grow or change. Jesus underscores this in the parable of the fig plant that is not born fruit. The landowner threatens to cut down the fig tree, and the gardener responded, Lord, give it one more year, and I will dig around it and give it fertilizer. See, you see, change must begin with truth. We must confess. We must see our present circumstances with integrity. We must face the hard truths. Once we perceive the fig plant, our faith, Once we perceive that it lacks adequate nutrients in its soil, we know that we need to fertilize it. Only then will the fig plant bear fruit. For us, this means that once we confess and turn back toward God, we can clearly see the path upon which Jesus leads us. The good news in all of this is that grace allows us another chance to get it right. And we need a lot of those chances for sure. In the last year, we have been traumatized by the disruption of our lives caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Add the graphic killing of Ahmed Arbery and the killing of George Floyd, these videos that that flooded, flooded our awareness. Add the intense wildfire season and the armed siege of the U.S. Capitol. And our collective drama is probably greater than most of us 
ever imagined it would be. It's more than any of us have ever endured before. And so we, undoubtedly traumatized, like the ancients, approach Jesus. We tell him about the pandemic dis disruption and half a million deaths in this country. We tell him about racial killings, about natural disasters, and an attack on our political system. And like the people who approached Jesus, we want to know, how can this happen? How can this happen to our neighbors? How can this happen to us? Tempted to rely on easy answers or to deny reality, or to return to childhood thinking to find meaning, we ask Jesus for clarification. And the answer, the answer is the same as it was for the ancients who turned to the earthly Jesus. Do you think the suffering of these Galileans proves that they were more sinful than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. In this time of trauma, the way through it is to nurture our faith. We must repent of the lack of international cooperation and of our poor climate stewardship that leads to extreme national disasters and has led to an uncontrolled pandemic. We must repent of the sin of white supremacy that is deeply embedded in our nation and our world. We must confess the sin of our greed and of Christian nationalism. Though the pandemic did not cause racism and other ills of our society, like Jesus' teachable moment on repentance, we have been given a teachable moment for learning and changing. This is true as a nation and as a congregation. In the words of Jesus, unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. Repentance. What a churchy word, right? Repentance is to turn back toward God. It is to confess our sins, our mistakes, and failures so that we can refocus on becoming the people God creates us to be. Without repentance, repentance of individual sins, but also our historical sins. Without, without repentance, without understanding and acknowledging where we find ourselves, we will not grow, we will not change, and our faith will wither on the vine. And so we have a choice. We can leave the fig plant alone and hope that next year it'll bear fruit. It won't. But we can, we can hope to do nothing. Or we can see the fig plant for what it is and fertilize it so that it will bear fruit. We can emerge from this pandemic a newly enlightened people willing to let go of the past, to embrace the radical teachings of Jesus that put the basic needs of housing, food, health care, and equity first and foremost. We can emerge as revolutionary followers of Jesus who are recommitted to interconnectedness and wholeness in our fragmented world. We can make that choice. We can hope the fig plant bears fruit. We just leave it be. Or we can do some, some heavy-duty fertilizing and change the world. Amen. We try, we fail, do too little, too late.
When I was growing up, I went to a church that had a great big altar in the front. And I have to tell you that altars have always made me nervous. I looked at that altar and I thought, hmm, if you were coming to the temple, as people did back in biblical times, and you wanted to get things right with God, you would bring an offering and maybe it would be a pair of pigeons. Maybe it would be a dove. Maybe if you had something big to settle or figure out, you would bring a lamb. How would you ever figure out what was an acceptable offering? How would you know what to bring? And how would that make things right with God in the first place? So altars have always made me a little bit nervous. I was so pleased to come into the Disciples Church and find in the front a table. A table says to me, ha, ah, the table says, come in and sit down and be one of us. Um, you are in community with us and you will be given something here that will sustain you. I like a table better than an altar. To me, a table is, is a symbol worldwide uh, of welcome. Um, we want certain things as people. We want to belong. We need to be reminded of who we are and what we are, that we are indeed made of dirt and the breath of God. And so is everybody else who comes to the table. And we need to remember to welcome everyone who comes to our table. Um, and and not, not expect everyone to be just like us. We will be at the table with people that we know and people who are strangers. We'll be at the table with people who are older than we are and much younger. Some people maybe who make us a little uneasy and people that we really um, we don't know at all. And then some who are so dear to us because we've known them all their lives. And we can just hardly wait to see them again. But we all gather around this table. And it's our job to be inclusive and welcome everyone to the table because the table is the foundation of our church. And of course, the table was set for us first by Jesus. And now we set it for one another. I set it for you. You set it for for me, the children upstairs in the worship center set it for one another. This is something that we do as disciples. And we invite everyone, everyone to this table. It's the place where you do belong, whoever you are. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup and poured out the wine and said, This is my blood of the new covenant. Take and drink it. Eat this and drink this 
as often as you gather and remember me. Pray with me, please. Gracious God, who calls us to this table, help us remember that we are your beloved children made of dust and your breath. Please lead us to be inclusive of one another, generous of heart, confident of your love. Let us remember that we are on Jesus' path and let us do as he would have us do to help bring your light into the world. We ask in his name. Amen. As you go out today, make the choice to fertilize the fig plant so that it will bear fruit. Go in peace, my friends.